Trustee Rippey. Trustee Benucci. Here. Trustee Fay. Here. Trustee Lamb. Here. Trustee Peck. Here. Mayor Collins. Here. If we could rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the We're seeking a motion to approve the minutes of the Committee of the Whole workshop held on September 8th. So move. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. Presidential comments? Uh, just one real quick one. <clears throat> Myself, Trustee Rippey, and Benucci all attended uh, Wish Upon a Star uh, benefit at Nevins yesterday, and it was ran so well, it was packed out there. And uh, Nevins also, any drinks sold out there gave half the profits to Wish Upon a Star. So I just want to say it was very well received, and that's all I got. Trustees' comments? Go Bears. <laughs> Talk quick. Go ahead, Dan. I, I have one. I also just want to... Uh, Mirror the mayor's sentiment and thank uh, Nevins for hosting that event. It was a wonderful event. Uh, Make a Wish Foundation. We were talking to one of the organizers. Uh, made quite a bit of money off of it, and it was actually interesting because it started in somebody's backyard. So, uh, thank you for raising money for such a wonderful, worthwhile cause. And that's all I have for now. Thank you. Um, I just uh, I got a call um, from Mike Boyd who asked me to mention that um, our one of our police uh, canine officers passed away and they're going to have a little ceremony for him on Thursday starting at the police department just before 10 o'clock and then going to the fire department. Uh, Chief, would you like to elaborate on that? Yes, we're, we're going to have a little memorial service for uh, our, our canine, uh, Aaron, who's been with us for several years, uh, who partnered with uh, Officer Brian Wagner, passed away uh, while on duty uh, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. Um, uh, Aaron had served with us for, for many, many years, um, and uh, we are going to have a, a sh short memorial service for her on Thursday morning. Uh, it'll be at the fire department headquarters on 135th Street starting at 10 a.m. Uh, there will be a, a short procession, but I would, I would just uh, urge anyone that would like to come to go directly to the fire department headquarters, and that'll start at 10 a.m. on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other trustee comments? Not this would be time for public comments on items not on the agenda, not to exceed three to five minutes per topic. If there are no public comments, then we'll proceed with the workshop meeting. First item on the agenda is updated design concept, Illinois Route 126, I-55 interchange. Yes, uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, as the board is aware and the public's aware, uh, the village has partnered with Romeoville and Bolingbrook to look at interchange improvements at Route 126 and at Airport uh, Lockport Road. Um, this is an ongoing long-term type project, but there's been quite a bit of study and review that's taken place over the past couple of years. And tonight we actually have uh, an individual. He is the uh, Director of Civil Engineering at Upchurch. His name is uh, Mark DeWiggins. He's going to be providing a presentation for the board this evening about the work and the progress that's been completed. Upchurch has partnered with V3 as part of this project. I know we've had Dave Hessling here before to do presentations. Um, this is, in essence, the same updated presentation that Dave would provide as they're partnering with Upchurch. So um, without further ado, uh, we'll have uh, Mr. DeWiggins uh, approach the board. Thank you, Alan, and uh, thank you, Board, for inviting us to be here tonight. It's always a, a pleasure to update on this uh, project as, as it seems to be going, uh, <clears throat> it's taking its time, and sometimes we need to be reminded of, of what's going on. And there is a development now uh, that uh, we've been asked to update on. Uh, as Alan said, my name is Mark Dwiggins. Uh, I work with Dave Hesslinga at V3. Uh, I am actually with the Upchurch group. Uh, we were, maybe some of you know, involved with Bolingbrook early on when Bolingbrook 
had a study to provide two new ramps to the Essington Road Route 126 intersection interchange to provide better access for the southwest portion of the Bolingbrook area. Uh, that project study was going on concurrently with the one that V3 in Romeoville was doing for the interchange at Airport Road. Uh, and as things progressed, uh, the projects merged together, and now they're considered one project in the eyes of IDOT and, and, and the villages of uh, Romeoville, uh, Bolingbrook, and now Plainfield has uh, joined in uh, with the support of the project. Um, Dave could not be here tonight, as he was asked, Randy asked Dave to be here. I am taking his place. And uh, just to uh, update, let's see, down works the next one. Okay. The progress to date uh, started several years ago, and we had some a community action, uh, community advisory group had several meetings, and maybe some of you are on them. I think I remember some of the faces here on the meetings. Out of those meetings, uh, we came up with 27 different alternates for the interchange combinations at Airport Road and Route 126. <clears throat> of those 27 alternates, uh, we looked at some of those and did a fatal flaw analysis on them, and eight of those alternates passed the fatal flaw analysis that we had. And after we applied the fatal flaw analysis, uh, we applied the analysis in, in step number three there of whether th those alternates met the purpose and need of the project. After that uh, step, Three alternates were deemed to meet the purpose and need of the project, and those alternates were to be recommended for further study, and then an, another analysis uh, for the uh, soci social, community, environmental effects, and hopefully that would be reduced to one preferred alternate at that point. To go to that next step, uh, they needed the concurrence of the other FHWA, or the other federal agencies that have some kind of jurisdiction or say over the project. And that is what uh, Dave and V3 has been working on for the past few years of getting it through what they call the NEPA 404 merger people. They meet three times a year and they have to have uh, projects uh, information in months ahead of time and it's a very slow process. But they got the purpose and need statement approved oh, a year or so ago. Now we're in the process of getting the uh, concurrence for the environmental and so on. So that's that's the point that we're at right now. We're we're right at this point, trying to trying to get to the next step of winning those three alternates down to one. Uh, and at that point, back in February, this alternates evaluation report was published, which that previous chart came from. Uh, that explained all of the different alternates and how we got to the three alternates and it presented the three alternates recommended for carry through. This was presented to IDOT and, and the NEPA groups, the federal agencies, uh, as part of their materials for concurrence. Uh, just quickly, the three alternates that were recommended to be moved forward, there's alternate 2B we call it, which involves an interchange, a diamond interchange at Route 126 interchange and then a bridge over route, carrying Route 140, 143rd Street over the interstate to supply traffic uh, uh, conveyance back and forth to Romeoville and Plainfield. Uh, the next alternate was alternate we call it 3B, which is two separate interchanges. One, the ramp additions at Route 126, and then the airport road interchange, which they call a, a spuddy uh, interchange where they all converge on top of the interchange. Uh, that's two separate interchanges. And then the third one was alternate 3E where they call it a spread diamond interchange in which the two, two ramps are at Airport Road and two ramps are at Route 126 and they're connected with front, frontage roads in between. So if you were on southbound Route 155 or I-55 and wanted to uh, or if you're on Essington Road, I, I, I'm sorry, and you wanted to get onto the interstate, you would have to travel down the frontage road and then get on at the airport road interchange. And conversely, if you wanted to get onto Essington Road and go north into Bolingbrook, you would access at, at airport road and then take the 
uh, Furnage Road up to Essington Road exit and then fly over uh, 126 and on to Essington Road and then up to Essington Road. Excuse me, Mark. Mark? Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Could you pick up that portable mic and just go over because I know you're pointing and yeah, everything yeah. else, but I apologize. I don't for think anybody has any idea when you talk about Essington Road and that on the diagram. I think it'd be a little more clear if you at least okay. pointed your finger towards it, sir. Yeah, I, I forgot to bring my pointer with me, so I apologize. Uh, this is the ramps that are to be constructed over off I-55 over and up to Route 126 and Essington Road intersection. That's an existing intersection to access the bowl, the Bolingbrook points, then they would go through this intersection around the curve and up through Essington Road. Uh, conversely, traffic coming from the north would travel down Essington Road around the curve to the intersection here, then onto the ramps. And in this scenario, they would travel down the Furnage Road and then e enter onto the interstate down there at Airport Road. In the previous scenario, the Furnage Road wasn't here, and, and the ramp would just dive cur immediately onto I-55. And conversely, the, the traffic going north would immediately go onto the ramp and the flyover on, on I-55 to the intersection at uh, the existing intersection with Route 126 and Essington Road. Uh, after this was presented to the agencies in February, they had a chance to review it. Uh, and they, have, they had a NEPA 404 merger meeting in June, and prior to that, they scheduled a field trip in May, and that was with the, the, the NEPA participants, or FHWA, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. EPA, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service, and IDOT. At that meeting, there were concerns by the Corps of Engineers and Fish and Wildlife Service that that ramps going through from I-55 flyover to connect up with the Essington Road intersection there at Route 126 was dividing the existing wetland in two. They did not think that was a good idea, and they suggested that any ramp would travel uh, around the wetlands or minimize the wetlands in some fashion rather than simply cut, divide, dividing them in two. And to explain that more, uh, the wetlands of uh, the Lily Cache Creek are in this big triangle formed by Route 126 and I-55. There's, there's a little bit over on the other side, the Lily Cache Slough goes through. And if you remember from the previous slides, that ramp would cut right through the middle of it and separate that wetland, which uh, in their eyes was an undesirable thing for the wildlife. Then at the NEPA meeting at, later on in June, they echoed the same sediments that they would prefer not to have that divided. They also disagreed with the fatal flaw analysis uh, that displacements were not considered to be considered a fatal flaw. Uh, previously, that was considered a fatal flaw. Uh, several of the alternates involved taking residences and businesses in order to make the interchanges work right. So that's why they, there were just eight uh, alternates advanced uh, after the fatal flaw analysis. Now there are, if you take that fatal flaw out, there are now 14 an alternates to go to the next stage. So we go from 8 to 14 with that. And then to the next the meeting the purpose and need, you go from 3, which Dave presented in his report, to 13 now. So that's kind of where we're at. We're kind of, in, in a sense, it looks in essence, it looks like we're backtracking a little bit. Uh, as far as the airport road interchange goes, uh, they there's the Renwick, uh, yeah, the Renwick Preserve there, south of Lockport Road and west of I-55, that they say cannot have any land taken from it, so no ramps can go through that. 
uh, area there. So there's only one interchange alternate at Airport Road that meets that criteria, and that's the one that's being advanced. That's that spuddy type interchange that I showed you earlier. At 126, again, they did not want, th th these are quotes from the minutes of those meetings. Uh, they did not want to bisect the wetlands, and they asked V3 uh, if there was some other alternates that could uh, be reassessed, basically, so that it would not be dividing the wetlands and to impact the wetlands uh, in a uh, less of a fashion. One of the previous alternates that was discarded earlier was, we call it alternate 21, out of the report, and it's the flyover ramps, 555, and they would come in directly into Essington Road rather than sec the securitous route over here. Uh, the, and if you were to come up here, exit on northbound, and then want to get access Route 126, you would have to go on, in this alternative, go on 135th Street and then over to a relocated Essington Road to a, that e existing intersection location, but it, a revamped uh, Essington Road. This was thrown out earlier because of, uh, it was similar to the other alternate that we had that where it was coming up and just meeting right here at the single point instead of going to the securitous route. Plus, uh, there was resistance from the residents in the area here on traffic on 135th Street. So that, okay, okay. Well, that was why it was thrown out before, one big reason it was thrown out before, but they, but the resource agencies like the idea of the ramps cutting through just the corner of it rather than right through the middle of the wetlands. So they, we were asked to look at that alternate again. Uh, IDOT had some alternates too that came out of the meeting and just some tabletop scratchings that, that came out was the, up in the upper left hand corner was a roundabout spooey they call it, which would be a roundabout interchange on top of the interstate. Uh, the other one here is a tight diamond interchange, which is not quite a spuddy interchange, but it's, uh, the ramps are fairly close together. And then a half diverging diamond interchange. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Weber Road project or not, uh, but that is a full diverging diamond interchange proposed there. Uh, this would just be uh, one leg of it with I doubt would like to have the potential to access to the east after the, you know, at some time in the future. That's why the dotted lines are there, the roundabout, and then the tight diamond also access to the east. Um, there's resistance to that from Romeoville. We took those alternates and fleshed them out a little bit and came up with a tight diamond interchange. Uh, it's, it's just the, the ramps are real close together and the, and the ramp terminal junctions are fairly close to the interstate itself. Uh, we have, if you're northbound going over to Essington Road, you, ha you uh, have a stop right there at the ramp terminal junction on the uh, east side of the interchange, interstate uh, traffic light at the, on the west side where the other ramps come in, the other ramp terminal junction. Then travel down 126, the existing Essington Road intersection, then up Essington Road and down to Essington Road. This is what the, the roundabout interchange looked like as we started looking at it. It's basically a big roundabout uh, with no signals, uh, but there's some issues with it. We don't know if that's quite ready for prime time or not yet. Uh, a lot of traffic to try to put into a roundabout. The ones that we chose to advance to the villages are variations on that alternate 21 that I showed you before. Instead of, uh, here's alternate one that was presented to the villages where the ramps are the tight ramps like we had in that alternate 21, and then Essington Road is pulled down away from 135th Street. So there's, we aren't making this into a four or five lane road, but rather that part of it's down here, and then we just have a spur going up to access 135th that I believe this is Mary's Lane or... Okay, okay. 
Well, that's how you would get uh, to your house, then, if you're coming down from Messington Road, you'd, you'd, you'd go up that way. <laughs> this, this has, uh, route, uh, 135th Street is relocated in this uh, alternate. Uh, the downside is it's going through the concrete plant property here. It just have a single intersection uh, to carry on over to Route uh, 126 or into the, onto the ramps to the interstate. Okay. This is alternate two. It's similar, but uh, rather than taking the concrete plant property, we are maintaining the traffic on the existing alignment for 135th Street up to that existing intersection up there at Essington Road. Uh, we're moving Essington Road down, so you basically have two intersections to navigate to get northbound rather than just the one. But this preserves the concrete plant property if, if that would be that much of an issue later on. The third one that we looked at that we have uh, decided to present to the villages for their uh, review and thought is the partial di diverging diamond. It's a, it's a little bit different than what I showed you earlier because we, since there's no access to the east, we kind of spread that all apart and made it, uh, the ramps more tighter in. Uh, if you're northbound, you would come up to the intersection with the uh, traffic going, accessing the exit, northbound exit would intersect with the southbound, or the northbound exit would intersect with the northbound entrance at that intersection there, is in other words. Uh, and then continue on to the existing intersection there at Essington, then we would have to uh, rebuild Essington to a, a four or five lane cross section to an intersection at 135th and then on to Essington Road. But there's no, we're not rebuilding this at 135th Street to carry the traffic. Go ahead. That's road level. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, rebuilt it. We're in this scenario, we're rebuilding it to widen it out to carry the capacity. And we're also, instead of the angled intersection that there is now, uh, IDOT requires that the new intersections be at as close to 90 as you can, 90 degrees as you can. That's why we're angling it back in and, and redoing it a little bit there. So those are the three, those are the three alternates that we are looking at now to address the concerns of the federal agencies regarding this uh, ramps through the wetlands and dividing the wetlands. They will not approve something like that. So this is what we are coming up with for the Route 126 interchange. Uh, just uh, to give you a sense of what's still in the mix here is we still have this alternate 2B, which is the 143rd Street uh, with frontage roads and then the uh, dim uh, diamond interchange at 126, Route 126. And it, it may turn into a configuration similar to what we've showed in the last three, but some sort of an inter interchange there, Essington Road. I don't think anybody's really in favor of that because the uh, the traffic of, that is generated down there by Airport Road would not be able to access up in here very easily. And the Romeoville infrastructure isn't meant for that. And just, we talk about the interchange there at Airport Road. This is just a picture of it, that how a spuddy works. It's, uh, the traffic all uh, it goes up and there's a bank of traffic signals on top of the bridge. Uh, the, the example that I think of uh, that I travel sometimes is uh, Route 83 Torrance Avenue at the I-94 interchange. It's similar to that on the south side of Chicago. That was all I have. Uh, so I have a couple questions for you. I'm over here on the end. Okay. Can you just give me an answer to the $64,000 question? How many options are we down to now and, and what exactly? I mean, I've got your three alternatives, but it seems like we have more than that. Well, these are the three alternatives 
that we will look at for Route 126. Well, but how many total are there, that, including what isn't necessarily off of 126? Uh, I think, I, I, as I, technically there's um, like 14, 13 or 14, and I would have to go back through the report. Dave Hesslinger and his crew worked on that number, and I'd have to defer to him on which ones exactly are still in. But the ones that, I, I think it has to do with how the frontage road connections work. Uh, the, only air, the only interchange configuration at Airport Road is that spuddy type that's still in consideration. We have some alternates that have to do with 143rd Street and frontage road connections to 130, 143rd Street that do not have an interchange at uh, Airport Road. And at Illinois 126, we'll ha have to go with some configuration like we're showing here. Well, I, I'm going to say I do have a couple of concerns, at least on alternative one and two. And I, I, you know, the Lake Mary neighborhood that you have there, on those first two alternatives where you have the, the spur that is literally right directly in, in the entrance to their neighborhood, and then you're going to broaden traffic on Essington. So there's two entrances to that neighborhood on Lake Mary there up to your right. And you've got massive traffic that's, that's going to be taken up on both of them if that, those go through. And while I, I certainly understand the federal government's need to protect wetlands, I, I'm kind of more concerned about protecting our residents in that neighborhood. But <laughs> so I, I guess what I don't understand is why we can't draw people off of 135th and off of Essington, which are far more residential than 143rd extension or something off of Airport Road. How, and I, I guess I'm not quite following you. you, you go up to 143rd Street and then... Well, we've been asking for the 143rd extension, which would connect to 126. I mean, Essington's already there. Most of the Bolingbroke traffic, I would assume, would be drawn, the, the warehouse traffic that they're concerned about would be drawn to Weber anyway because the, the warehouses are closer to Weber. I, I, it, so mm -hmm. they would have to I assume that will happen at some point. But, I, I mean, you're, you're really kind of wreaking havoc on, on a couple of neighborhoods and a couple of our nicer neighborhoods, frankly, by, by putting in those spurs the way they're designed here. Mm -hmm. So what, what exactly is the concern then? The concern is the Essington Road traffic here? The well, road Essington road? and then right, oh. you see that, that spur? Right, right here? That's the, so the top spur is the entrance to their neighborhood. The other entrance to their neighborhood is, is on the east side of the end of the lake. So basically what you've done is you've made it nearly impossible for them to get in and out of their neighborhood. That's my concern. Are you concerned that the traffic, they, they would go, this, this is still remains a low volume road here, but are you concerned that they... Well. Well, is, is, okay, let, let me ask you this. Is 135th Street real high volume at this? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. It's a. Uh, okay, if we, folks, let's do this. If you have a question, could you come up to the podium here and use the mic? Because that way people at home can hear it too that weren't able to come. Well, while she's coming up, there is a lot of traffic on 135th right now. Mm -hmm. And this is not alleviated and creates a bigger problem for Lake Mary residents. Uh, okay. An awful lot of people come east to get to I-55 down 135th Street right now. There's no reasonable alternative. They come down 127th and down Essington, but not very many people do that. 143rd Street doesn't connect, so anybody mm -hmm. who wants to get on I-55 easily comes down 135th Street. And there's 75 driveways right along that road, mm -hmm. not even including what's involved in Lake Mary. So. Well, that's one reason that we were tasked to show this pulled away from 135th Street so that we don't impact the driveways there. But uh, the problem well, is most of the traffic of is Europe. coming from the west. I, I, I would like to show you uh, one of the, the alternates that, alternate 3B here. Uh, well, both of these alternates do show a connection to 143rd Street, this 143rd Street connector, as part of the total planning of the process. So this, these, our traffic numbers and our analysis assumes that this is going to be put into place in some fashion, either, either at this location or in some fashion. So 
that is still part of the mix is the, the overall project. And we aren't designing the bypass road. That's done, being done separately, but we are assuming that that will be put into place at some point. I just want to remind the, the audience, too, that on this Wednesday here at the Village Hall, we're going to have uh, representatives from the village to answer any of your questions also. So you can come and have a, a very personable questions and, and answer period, too. It'll be at 7 p.m. here at the, at the Village Hall. Okay. Did Go you, ahead. If you, ahead. All right. Actually, the reason why I was so anxious to get up here because it backed up with, with what Trustee Rippey had to say. Um, everybody's concerned about the 135th, which is very legitimate. The people cannot get out of their driveways in the morning. I'm part of the Lake Mary Club. We cannot get out with that. But when we had one of the meetings and they said, oh, yeah, the people are going to come out and do the study, do the study, we said, are your people going to be there in the morning when those school buses are delivering those children at the school? If you are there in the morning, not all those school buses pull in all at the same time. Some of them have to cut. We've got the car traffic and bus traffic. They're all trying to drop their children off. You've got people coming through from Naperville that are late for work. The speed limit is 35 right now, and numerous times there's never anybody. Our fence was hit again this week. They do not go 35. So when you've got two schools and a therapeutic horse farm that people have to turn into those driveways, that's dangerous in the morning. People are coming up from Naperville, bumper after bumper. They are going to pass those school buses. You cannot tell me that they're going to be patient. And you're talking about okay. Essington. On Essington. Not only 135th, we've already told you about that, but just the impact on also Essington Road. Those schools and the children, there's a sidewalk. We've told them that. There is a sidewalk. It's right on Essington Road. Those kids walk there. I mean, it's not in. It's right there along Essington Road. And I guarantee you, those people in the morning. Wait, wait, wait. wait okay. Wait. I can only hear one person. So yeah. that's, that's another concern. And I just wanted to back it up to what you said about yeah. uh, in 135th. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I almost feel bad. I want to tell the people when I drive on 135th, I live here. That's why I'm using this road because it is so, it really is busy. So they need to send people out at the busiest times of the day for their impact studies. And the schools are a huge concern. Those parents are backed out on trying to get their kids dropped off on a snowy day, a rainy day, and they're battling buses. And the buses sometimes sit in the media. Okay. So, all right. All right. Ma'am, could you hold up just for a minute? Just have a seat right there in the front row, and we'll get to you in just a second. Uh, trustees, do you have any questions or yes, comments? Yes, Mayor Collins, I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> yes. I know you would. <laughs> yes, I would. Uh, I'd like to ask, Mark, I'd like to make a comment first, and then I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I uh, use age as a criteria, I'm an awful lot closer to the end than I am the beginning. And, you know, I've been, uh, with that in mind, I think about ever driving on this particular situation. I don't ever think it's going to occur. And so I'm going to ask you a specific question. Uh, if this proposal was approved tonight, okay, A, B, or C, when, if ever, would be a completion date for it? Because, you know, we talk about endangered species. I'm an endangered species. Uh, I don't even think I'm going to be ever riding on that. We, we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. Seriously, sir, you're on the in. I'm not. When are we going to quit talking about it and actually have some action? We have been showing these different projects for years, A, B, C, D, 26 of this, 18 of those, and nothing is ever done. What is the major difficulty in that situation? I know you have to go back. In February, we have a meeting. Then we have one in June. And then it's 2014. Then it's 2020. It goes on and on. Assuming it was complete, uh, approved tonight, when, in your estimation, would it ever be completed? Well, I, I share your frustration, uh, Commissioner. Uh, we've been working on it for years and years now. And it, it, I liken this. Right, right now we're in a process with the NEPA merger people. If you people would approve it, it still has to go through that NEPA merger process. And I, I liken that to the Keystone uh, Pipeline project of, of this area of Will County because it just seems to be with the fish and wildlife people and, and the environmental, it just seems roadblock after roadblock. I may be in the end 
but I think that the villages, the trustees of the village of Plainfield and Bolingbrook and Romeoville are the ones that have the power to push Probably this along more, more than the engineers do. If this were approved by the board, your board tonight, and the other boards, Romeoville and uh, Bolingbrook, would select one of these alternates to push forward, uh, we would still have to go back to that NEPA 404 process, and, and maybe, maybe one of these would be okay. Maybe one of these would work for them. Uh, let's say, you know, just uh, yeah. Say, 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 for instance, if somehow or other that one was approved, uh, probably over the objections of some of the people here. But so if, if this was approved by the NEPA people, 404 merger people, that that means that they would have no objections to it. They would not throw up roadblocks to it. That doesn't mean it would get built now because right now there is no funding within IDOT for this project. Okay? So that's, it's got to be on the multi-year program at some point. Some funding's got to be identified for, you know, we're looking at several millions of dollars. So it's, it's a, you know, that would take some time to get put in. And I, I guess that's where I say that the pressure applied by the municipalities would be, uh, would have more bearing and would do more than anything to speed this up. Um, your guess is as good as mine on, on that. I, I don't know. You know but, but in the context of that, if you don't mind me asking, go ahead. Um, Weber Road mm -hmm. has been how long in the design uh, phase and funding phase? Uh, that is going on a faster track than what this is. And I think it's, oh, I don't know, at least five years, it seems like, in the design and funding phase and and that's that's an approved project that's going now that's finished the, the phase one reports done and I think they're well, getting ready to finalize a phase one report and move on to phase two which is the actual design of the construction documents uh, but if it were approved tonight and I, I would say go with it you know I, it's still five or ten years out it's a minimum of ten years is the point I think that you need to uh -huh. uh, point out yeah you're, you're, you're prob looking you're probably closer a fast to a fast track project like Weber Road is a ten-year project mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Wasn't I-35, I-355 extension like 30 years from the time they built the property to the time that we had the Correct. I-355 extension? Mm -hmm. So, You know, one last comment, sir, and I, I'm not meaning, I'm meaning to be disrespectful. I know you're here in a lion's den trying to uh, pacify they, a, a they different... They didn't warn me about this. Well, uh, you know <laughs> what... Uh, <laughs> I, if you had called, I would have given you a good. <laughs> but that that leads to my particular point. You said that we as a, we as trustees, commissioners in the various communities are the driving forces. Uh, actually, sir, I'm in total disagreement with that particular concept. It's really great that you're here tonight, but I can remember uh, just uh, not even a couple years ago, uh, I was a trustee and I wasn't even invited to some of the initial meetings for presentation on this particular project. Uh, the village of Plainfield was excluded. Uh, I'm glad you're here tonight and I'm glad you're saying we're a driving force. I would certainly, with this current administration, it will be a driving force because we have to get it done. In 10 years, that would be wonderful. But uh, again, I really don't know if that'll ever occur. But thank you anyway, sir. Thank you. Uh, I put a couple of his comments in the context. Uh, he's correct that we were not involved originally. Uh, we're now Bolingbrook, Romeoville, and Plainfield, and we are contributing the uh, slightly largest share of that. Mm -hmm. So we are a significant player in that, which we were not originally. One was driven by Romeoville, the other was driven by Bolingbrook. Mm -hmm. And when you put it together, we said, that ah, affects us more than anybody else. Therefore, that's right. we end up paying more for it. Therefore, we'd like to have some say. So we'd mm -hmm. like to see some progress. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a couple of questions that uh, you may not have the answer to because you weren't the source of the information originally, some of the earlier presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked earlier, who makes the decision on this? And I was told IDOT and the Federal Highway, whatever it is, organization. Federal Highway Administration, yes. And they're the two that make the ultimate decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, is any, can anybody override the, the wetlands? I mean, I don't know exactly what's so valuable about those wetlands. Can you explain that to me or anybody? I, you know, they, they could be overridden, I suppose. It's just that they, FHWA is part of the phase, we're in the phase one project report phase of it, and they have to get concurrences and sign-offs from the wildlife people as part of moving from the phase one to the phase two, which is actual contract documents. Um, right now, it's being driven by, you know, two or three people on those 
commi- on those agencies that come to the meetings. You know, that it's their, I don't know if it's their personal opinion. I'm sure they're they're getting guidance from you know their higher ups in, in administrative policy that they're they're parroting right now. But I'm sure that that could be uh, talked well, about. The things that we do here the, within the village, uh, we have to have findings of fact. I would like to see whatever the findings of facts are on the wetlands and see this is exactly mm-hmm. why they're so important because mm-hmm. one of the reasons we eliminate a lot of other things before is that we had to take out houses and do some other things. Now you're saying, well, those are back in because we're protecting something where there's nobody. Right. And we don't even know right. why it's important. So. Well, that's, that, well, that's my question, too. And I saw the meeting minutes and Dave Hessling has uh, comments on them. It's, uh, you know. uh, I also asked another question before, uh, and I was told that uh, the two deciding – decision-making organizations were leaning towards just one access. And now you're saying that's not true anymore? They're really looking for uh, two accesses on I-55, one at 126 and the other one at the airport. That, that's correct. The, the, decision make, the decision makers like to look at the overall, uh, like somebody traveling from St. Louis to Chicago, uh, how, they, how they would be affected. And they, they'd like to see just one interchange, you know, less traffic uh, congestion and so on with interchanges. Unfortunately, that doesn't really meet the needs of the villages. And I think that's been brought to their attention more and more. And, and they're, they're willing to go along with that. Uh, with the it, separate interchanges at 126 and the interchange down at Airport Road. Um, well, that was our original preference, but we were told, well, it's not likely to happen. But I'm glad to see that at least something oh, that's looking at it and the decisions may be going in a more logical direction. Now, if it, we get the it, wetlands, then we'd be better yet. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, my, my guess is that something will happen at both Airport Road and Route 126. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. My, <clears throat> excuse me, my question is, is on the truck traffic that's going to come off of there. I mean, the whole point of the Airport Road and the bypass was – to get the trucks, let them bypass around, get to where they need to go, and not be in the residential areas. If they get off at at 126, that's the other issue they're going to have in their streets. I mean, you can put the uh, the weight limits up and all that stuff all you want, but you're going to have it, it's just going through too much of a residential. And I don't understand. And I know this is you, you're unfortunately are getting the brunt of mm-hmm. this, but I don't see that this is necessarily in the best interest. Of Plainfield, I see it in the in a good interest for Bolingbroke and Romeoville, and mm-hmm. politics the name of the game. With that, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. but that's you know, but that's not in our best interest. The way this is designed, just I maybe ten years out, but that ten years will fly by pretty quickly. I just, I don't, I don't think it's right. I'm sorry. Sorry. Right. Thank you for your patience. Sure. And to add to that, I have two parts of my statement i guess you'd say the most expensive home that is sold between plainfield romeoville bolingbrook and naperville was in plainfield and uh, the little lakens two million dollar home if we put something like that there do you realize what it's going to do to the property values and most of the homes in those areas are high-priced homes and we play pay a lot in taxes Mm -hmm. so you're ruining one of the best things we've got in plainfield by doing that my second part is on Essington, we do have three schools with about 2,500 kids, and there it's a blinking light. You can only go 20 miles an hour two times a day. Now, what what is that going to do to traffic on Essington? Mm-hmm. Well, there's no doubt that there's, there's there's no doubt that if if these were put into place, the Essington traffic would increase. Now, bear in mind, we, we started this project out years ago. And at the point we started it out, there was no houses on the lake, or very few houses. There's no schools on Essington. Now, now it's all been built up, so these issues are becoming more important. Um, it's Bolingbroke's desire to have uh, some sort of an access to the southwest corner of the their uh, incorporated area. So it's it's. Uh, I'm uh, the designer. <laughs> I, I put forth the drawings, and then, then you, you guys decide. Do you have to come up? We can't hear any questions. You have ma'am. to come up if you're going to talk. The question was why can't Bolingbrook be directed more toward Weber Road, which does make sense. Mm-hmm. Hello. I've been to several of these, and uh, I thought we had an ace working for us at Lockport Street. You do an interchange at Lockport Street and 55, that goes up uh, around the stone quarry and ties into 126 at that point. That's not even on your map. Uh, 
Why? Well, in his defense, tonight was just to talk about the 126. 126. Oh. Th that, those other parts, that was, as he was talking about, th those are all different items. Why this came forward is that there was new information as it relates to the wetlands, oh. and that's why uh, we invited him to the My village mistake. board. I thought you were talking uh, one of the, uh, the, th th road. Those other portions, there, th there are still multiple iterations that are being considered and discussed and the like. However... Those iterations have already been presented uh, publicly. So th this was just a new uh, circumstance that we thought uh, warranted uh, the attention. Because being the third man now, it's obvious who got the power. I mean, Romeoville and Bolingbrook pull it up north away from Plainfield. And like Marge was saying, you know, we're putting in the biggest amount of money. We should have a little bit more consideration instead of uh, having those other two communities uh, pull it too far north and into a residential area. Mm -hmm. Just my point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Larry Ketchell, uh, resident village of Plainfield. Um, I know this doesn't encompass this, but when you talk about Airport Road and you talk about 126 and you talk about the traffic that it'll generate, I won't be alive. I'm like Mr. Rasich. It's the other end of it you're looking at right now. But the fact of the matter is, Essington Road, they put a stoplight in there to warrant it. Uh, as far as traffic considerations, well, it's tied into it. It's there right now. If we get all that traffic into the village of Plainfield and 126 goes through there for the next 20 years, you're be looking at an intersection at Lockport Street up above there. Lockport Street's going to go right through town. There's no lights. There's a river. There's a railroad crossing. The school, the high school, lets out and lets out, brings all their buses to the north, and they take them to the south there every day. You have an intersection, which IDOT is trying to get away from, that's on an angle, and nothing's being said about what's happening on that end of it. Well, if, you, if this even goes through in 126 is there, by the time the village could get it over to 143rd Street, it could be 30, 40 years away. And they do traffic studies and traffic warrants. I think there should be some type of warrant taken for 126 in Lockport Street. We've got a riverfront foundation going in there right now. Everything is crammed together at a corner. And the corner itself has lots of traffic going into it. And it's something that should be taken a look at when you're looking at these two sections here. Thanks. Thank you. You know, I, I have s somewhat of a silly question. It seems like uh, the transportation is worried about dissecting the wetlands. It's not going to work. We, can, we cannot dissect the wetlands. If I'm not mistaken, the bridge is not going to be at ground level. Mm -hmm. It's going to be over mm -hmm. the wetlands, per se, other than some pillars. Mm -hmm. And the second question I have is I always hear displacement of the wildlife. What wildlife? Now, are we talking snails or grasshoppers or what? Because every time, I, and I, I have all the respect, and I'm certainly glad that you're here, and I'm sure that you're not. But, <laughs> I, but, right. but do you see what I mean? We, mm -hmm. All we do is always hear wetlands <coughs> and, and, di and the animals, but we never hear of anything. It seems like just an excuse. Well, uh, that seems like that to me sometimes too I, I agree but I, I think their concern is that snails grasshoppers birds I think they all think of that as a whole ecosystem and, and it's, they want the whole ecosystem to be able to communicate back and forth as it does now they don't want to change the ecosystem um, well but remember then the meeting in June they said that displacements don't count as much now as uh, the wetland issues you know residential and business displacements and that could change under a different EPA administration, sure. correct? Well, and, and all of this, you're exactly right, and all of this has is, is been evolving over the last 10 years since this whole process has been going on. Uh, the, it, it's, it's constantly changing. We're just trying to hit it at some point and get an approval so we can move ahead. Well, hey, 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 hey. we can't hear you. Mm -hmm. How you doing? My name is uh, Romus Yadbalkis. I'm a resident of Plainfield and business owner in Plainfield. Um, question I have, I guess, is 
uh, if, and I haven't heard a lot of uh, information on the Route 30, 143rd Street extension, but I guess the question would be is since that would be the goal to bring truck traffic from Route 30 through to 126 and over to I-55, whether it be north or south. Uh, but the question really is, if you had Route 30 extension in place, how would the traffic studies warrant 135th Street? So would there be a lot more traffic going down 143rd, which would change the whole volume of traffic on 135th Street, which would change this whole study from the beginning? I think, sir, that some of these issues that you're talking about are being considered in, in some of the traffic models that they're uh, working up right now uh, with CMAP, Chicago uh, Metropolitan Association, uh, with the traffic studies. Uh, it's, it's a very complex model with, with all the different things. That there's no traffic on those theoretical roads right now, so we're, they would have they're trying to model and, and do a best guess as to what would happen, but I, I believe that there's some effort towards doing that right now with this bypass and with the work, some of the work that Plainfield's doing. Maybe, maybe the Plainfield staff can speak to that better than I can. Uh, the overall, it's, it's a very complex uh, issue here, and, and that's one reason why they wanted us to consider these interchanges together instead of separately, you know, several years ago, and they, 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 they threw them together, and, and they were, we're talking about a whole regional regional uh, impact. Um, the bypass that Romy is talking about, though, has been the highest priority for several years. We recognize it will significantly change the traffic patterns. It will take the trucks off 135th. That would be the logical way to get to I-55 rather than come up 126 or 135th Street. So, yeah, but that, the problem with that is it's a village-driven project. Uh, we have not yet identified a source of federal money that will help us do that, but if you have the airport interchange, though, we have to have that bypass. So it's never been off of our plans, if you will. How do we get there from here? We wish we knew. But you're right. I, I totally agree with it. I think it will totally change the traffic pattern, uh, make a big difference, and to get, get rid of the confusion downtown where trucks are turning, you know, 120 degrees to make a... A turn. I, I personally, and I probably speak for most of the residents, um, is that I would focus on getting the 143rd Street extension through, and that will alleviate 90% of the traffic on 135th Street, maybe 80, I'll give you that. But it will alleviate a lot of the traffic, and it will open it up for trucks. The trucks won't have to go through downtown Plainfield, and it, it's a simple answer. And I really don't understand why uh, no one is really pushing that. And they're pushing a 120, 126 south ramp, which to me is worthless. Well, well, to, well on that point, so on clear. that point, if, if you don't mind me saying, and, and, and I'll wrap up on, on, on with this, 143rd has been absolutely a priority for uh, staff and for the administration. It continues to be a priority. Um, Frankly, we have been working very hard to be able to get that moved on to phase two. We actually have a grant uh, for $500,000 to go toward the phase two environmental studies that need to take place on that. Uh, we have been having some fantastic conversations that need to take place, but as was mentioned, it's a 20-year project, 30-year project. It's going to take, there are a number of different hurdles that have to go through uh, uh, on all of these different projects. And, and then lastly, I, I, I will say, first off, Mark, thank you for coming out uh, and, and uh, at least it's presenting this to us. Uh, and, and it, I'm sure it wasn't, but still, nevertheless, thank you for, for indulging us and, and more importantly, for informing us and educating us on what's going on. Uh, we do know that this is a, a minimum 10-year project. More than likely, it's a 20-year uh, project. As you mentioned, federal funding is very much an issue. Um, the, the federal government has not been able to uh, uh, pass a budget, let alone come up with a comprehensive replacement for ice tea or safety loo, is that what the latest iteration is called? Those are the federal uh, funds for transportation. So with all of those different issues going on, uh, this, all of these projects 
while they remain a priority, uh, become a very diff difficult dynamic in trying to pull off. Uh, and I do want to thank you for uh, coming out here. I do want to thank the staff for managing all of these different projects. And uh, we'll continue to have meetings like this as we go along to try to keep you all informed and the like. As the uh, mayor mentioned, uh, we, we actually uh, have been invited out to the Lakelands Homeowners Association meeting on uh, Wednesday night. It'll be here at the Village Hall at 7 o'clock. Um, I think that there's some shared uh, interest with Lake Mary folks. So by all means, if it's okay, Don, I'm going to invite the Lake Mary folks, at least on the traffic side, to come on out and uh, join us. And we'll be able to talk through a couple of other items, too. Uh, so, Mark, thank you very much. If there are no other thank questions, you. we can move on to our next item. The next item on the agenda is demolition ordinance. Yes, thank you. Um, this matter is coming before the village board uh, pursuant to a um, really a conceptual discussion. Um, this matter went before the HBC approximately a month and a half ago. The HBC, a Historic Preservation Commission, had several different uh, workshops. I think there was a general consensus um, with regards to the HBC that the uh, demolition ordinance, which was adopted in um, 2005, that perhaps it was cumbersome, uh, perhaps overly complicated. And based on that fact, they uh, asked staff to basically take a, a, a grasp or basically take a look at the um, ordinance and, and see if there are some ways we could tweak it or change it. Based on that direction, staff, um, what you see before you this evening is a draft of a three-page document. I think staff's initial uh, intent here was the at the end of the day is to streamline the document, to try to prov provide a little more balance between, obviously, the legitimate property rights of every individual, um, which I think we take quite seriously, but also to try to recognize that uh, some of the, try to address some of the preservation issues regards to the historical fabric of the village of Plainfield. So what you see uh, before you this evening is a three-page document. In some of the substance, to very briefly uh, highlight the proposed fundamental changes. As of right now, uh, if a property is um, it's recommended by the HBC, uh, somebody comes in for a demolition permit, and the HBC uh, identifies that property as historically significant. And of course, we're not talking about landmarks. When you talk about landmarks as a complete, anything as a landmark or in a district is a complete different analysis. This is obviously, there's no legal protection. What would require is the board to basically, if they believe it's appropriate, they can require the applicant to basically do a community impact study. As you recall, we've had several projects which um, theoretically have requested a community impact study, but during the uh, duration of the, since this uh, ordinance was adopted in, in 2005, no community impact study has ever been completed by, a, um, by an applicant. No structure in the village has ever been preserved or saved because of a community impact study. It's never been done. And based on that fact, what staff is proposing to do is completely eliminate the community impact study uh, and pursuant to some, what some other villages have done, incorporate a cooling off period of three months. Now again, this is only for those buildings which have been recommended by the HBC as being historically significant. And again, most importantly, uh, approved and concurred by the village board. The village board has the ultimate decision. The HPC would only be making a recommendation. It would be the village's board's prerogative to ask an applicant to hold off for demolition for a period of three months to allow to see if there's any potential uh, alternatives to demolition. Um, that is at the direction and prerogative of um, the village board. For those cases which are not historically uh, significant, obviously staff would be directed to expedite the demolition permit um, and would basically direct the village, village uh, building department to go ahead and proceed uh, with the demolition permit. Uh, since just from my experience, probably 75% of all demolition, maybe 80% of all demolition requests in the village are basically expedited. So we're only talking about a relatively small number of structures, i.e. those structures uh, which have been identified as basically uh, identified as potential landmarks which are not protected by lo local landmark designation or, or located within a district uh, or potentially contributing uh, to a potential district. Um, so that at the end of the day, that's what generally this proposed uh, summary of the actual major changes to the tax amendment. In addition, what we've done is incorporated a um, defined timeline while there is a timeline in the building permit, generally building permits are good, I believe, for one year. 
what we our current ordinance does not have an actual timeline for how good a demolition permit um, is good for and that was a major concern of the Historic Preservation Commission based on that fact we have incorporated a one-year period uh, so if the applicant was not able to proceed with demolition they would have to come back for the village before the village board and ask for an extension of that permit in addition um, these permits would not be able to be transferable so a, a developer or owner could not transfer um, the permit itself to another party uh, with regards to notice a notice basically be a uh, again generally the same and with regards to i think staff is very sensitive to the timeline um, and based on that fact we will be required to take any demolition application to the HBC for a full hearing within 30 days and we would need to schedule once the HBC makes a recommendation we would basically schedule that before the village board within seven days of course if the HBC concurs with the demolition at that point a demolition a demolition uh, application would be approved um, at that point if they make a recommendation for a waiting cooling off period we would take it to the board again schedule that within seven days of the HBC's recommendation so again what staff has attempted to do is make a very simple understandable ordinance a uh, three-page document to streamline this document from a, um, a fairly, fairly cumbersome existing document which was based on Winnetka's um, previous demolition ordinance and I think I think there's a general consensus that perhaps it is too cumbersome so with that I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that the village board may have so, mr. Garrigan just so we just so everybody out on television knows the current ordinance is actually 12 pages long that's correct right okay so we've gone from 12 to 3. Gone to three. I think the streamlining is uh, you did a nice job with it and I support it I think it uh, gives us a little more leeway or, or strength if you will and uh, doesn't doesn't delay the process I've got a few comments well, I agree that and Brian's already highlighted the fact that it went from 12 to four pages, which is uh, impressive. And I think uh, there's some other distinct improvements in it. Um, HPC and the applicant work together if it has historical value. Before, it was always homeowner or whoever owns the property. It's not burdens on you. And now we're saying you got 90 days for the applicant to work with the HPC. The HPC is putting energy into it, which I have great value for. You got five of the people right behind you. <laughs> They're very good at getting involved and being very helpful. So I think that's good. Uh, I also like the one year review. Uh, you don't have things continuing forever. Uh, things may change, you know. So if they want to continue the demolition, have a permit for it, then uh, come back. Let's talk about it again and let's see how it goes. Uh, I'm a little concerned about, I don't understand exactly, scheduling the village board in seven days. Do you expect to actually have it in front of the village board within seven days? No. We scheduling would schedule. means you put it on the schedule. It could be a week or two weeks or That's a month correct. out. That's whenever the next village board meeting is. But again, um, all, just, time is of the essence. We're trying to be sensitive to the property. Uh, I, I agree. But let's just not be unrealistic about getting it to the board because uh, it does take a little bit of time to you know, get it to us. Correct. It'd be the next board, probably the next board meeting. The other thing is you're still looking for plans. If somebody wants to demolish and they're going to put something up, you'd like to see that. That's part of the pre-discussion and so on. So I, I think you've done an excellent job, Leif and you and the others who are involved have done an excellent job of putting this together. It's much simpler. I think it takes care of some of the issues because you're absolutely right. We never did you know, have the study. We never authorized it because it just was never justified, no cost. To it. Now it's no cost, but... We're going to work with you and see if we can't make something out of it and help you out. So uh, I love the way it's turned out. I think uh, made great progress and, and a lot simpler. People can understand it. 12 pages is tough to digest. So, Well, I guess I'll have a comment. Um, I'm glad we've decreased the, uh, the content. Uh, my question actually is the alternative analysis and the definitions um, you mentioned, uh, Michael, that we've eliminated the economic impact study, but uh, alternative analysis, is that going to be part of the process on the way I read it? It is, correct? Based on your, only your recommendation, if you concur. Okay. Right. So now what leads to, okay, when I read through this, it says an alternative plan prepared with professional assistance of an architect. Who pays for the architect? 
the homeowner or well obviously the hbc would have to basically work with the applicant on and i mean i think the way i the, the spirit of it is that we'd be working with pro pro bono that there would basically we would have some uh, architects who are basically which we do to be honest we have architects who have given pro bono services uh, on behalf of preservation and that's really at the end of the day um that's what i think we're generally looking at um it would be a, a consensual um process between the hpc and the applicant. Now, if the applicant did agree to hire an, uh, an architect at their expense, obviously they'd be paid for it. Sure. It would not be at the village's expense. I mean, I think th but that's clear like from the get-go, would not be at the village's expense with regards to paying any consultant. Could Then can we add that to, as a tax amendment at no additional cost to the applicant if we're going to be guaranteeing that they're not going to have to pay for an architect to get through this process? Unless they agree to. Right, unless they agree to, if they if they want to hire an architect, that may dispute what our, our, our pro bono architect finds. I mean, I, I, without guaranteeing that they don't have to pay for this, I mean, if you have an, if you have an ordinance you met and, and we vote on it and we ratify it and it says there has to be professional assistance of an architect and the pro bono one isn't pro bono at some point, I mean, it, we have to follow the ordinance. How are we going to follow the ordinance without a pro, with, without that being right. paid for then? Right. Who's going to pay for it? Right. So I think that, that we, need to, we need to amend the text on that. And that, that's that's where I'm at with that. Um, so that's really it. I mean, my main concern is adding cost, you know, to the process of the homeowner that wants to, um, you know, to do a project. My other, actually, one other was you said it was non-transferable. Um, can someone from the HPC, if the, if the mayor is okay with that, um, speak on what what the thought process was behind that? My initial thought was, if somebody owns, you know, a structure, they go through this process, they work with the HPC, they get a dental permit, and then something changes in their life, and they decide, you know, I, I really need to sell my home and get out from under it. It would make it more marketable, possibly, if that dental permit was still transferable. I. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, real, Garrett, real quickly, in, in all honesty, uh, three years ago I started looking into this, and one of the reasons I did is because we had outstanding demolition permits that were going on for years. And the holder of this permit, perhaps, we can't read their mind, felt that this added some potential value to their property. Now, for me, if you're going to get a demolition permit, number one, technically you're supposed to say what you're going to do with the property once it's gone. So really, a new owner has changed that whole field of, of thought. So consequently, um, and, and as a quick aside, the old ordinance, if the holder of a permit was to lose that permit through legal means through our building department, you look through the old 12 pages, not, excuse me, nothing is really specific on how that permit can be withdrawn. So the idea of one year, and the, and the one year does have a chance to be extended without, without cost. If they've got a legitimate reason, we want to work with them. But it's just that I, your, your point was that you know, it might add value. That's exactly why in the first place that I started looking into this, I thought that I don't want people taking out uh, demolition permits with the idea that it might add value. Really, a demolition permit is meant to demolish the building. And, and really, the... This new, the new ordinance is really, really quite simple, and I've spent a lot of time reading through both of them, and I think that this, there's, there's a few things that we might be able to touch up exactly with your pro, pro bono uh, point, yeah. but also on that same thing, we're asking for 90, uh, was it 30 days? 30 days to uh, meet, is it 30 days? It's three months and less. Three months, 90 days. 90. But during this time, the goal is to have the, Historic Preservation Commission offer some ideas to, to put the, the owner into the process of what else could he do with it. We, we, we with your help, and, and we put a building in our town, uh, allowed it to be demolished, and as it turned out, it's a flower shop now. It escaped that demolition. So my point is that I think a demolition permit it should be issued on a, on a, a really needed basis, an urgent basis. And it shouldn't be held for uh, increased value. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of comments. I wouldn't put anything in on the pro bono. I think it's up to the uh, the applicant if he wants to hire an attorney. I would think it's up to the HPC to be persuasive enough to say, "Hey, we got some great ideas," and the applicant will say, oh, "I like to follow through with those. I'm going to get my my uh, architect to work on it." I wouldn't want to say it's got to be pro bono because he may choose to use an architect that 
has some skills or that he's willing to pay for. So I, but I think it's up to the HPC to convince them that there's a, a need for that. Real quickly, we do have an architect now on our commission. We've got a pretty good mix of, of people with, it, with levels of expertise, and one of the indi individuals on our commission now is a licensed architect. So, and he has uh, expressed a, a great amount of interest in historical structures and, uh, and architecture. So we do have that. Not, not that this is going to be considered an end-all, beat-all, but these are, the, these are the efforts and the knowledge we're going to bring to force during these 90 days to try and explain to the, to the applicant for demolition, there's something else you can do to keep our town from vanishing. Trustee Lamb, you had a good point. I think maybe I didn't articulate uh, where I was going with it. Um, essentially, what I don't want to do is I don't want to put a burden on the property owner to, ha to have to pay for an architect to comply with the proposed. Yeah, I, I think that's been taken care of. I don't think there's okay. anything in here that says they have to spend more money. Okay. All they say is we're going to talk to them. No cost. Is, and most applicants have been willing to do that. But they would want to put the money out unless they saw material benefit for themselves. So it's not us mandating, it's up to them to decide if they want to do it. Okay, I guess when this comes to a vote, then I'll ask our legal counsel, you know, as far as the ordinance is written, will this or will it not, you know, give, yeah. you know. They'll come back okay. in front of us if we're going to do it. But yeah. I have one other point, though. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> one other point. Uh, the $750 fine for, uh, or, or whatever it is, for, it's for one day. So if they, they tear the thing down, uh, you know, 750. It's not per day. Some of these things are continuing. This is just one, and that's I think inadequate. Uh, anybody really wants to tear something down, they're going to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars, do all the stuff they have to do, and so 750 more is insignificant. Uh, do we have any latitude to increase that? I, the reason I bring it up is, told a long time ago in the Lakelands, we have a, a builder's fee. And it was originally 1500 bucks, and the realtors kept saying, you know, no developer is going to pay any attention to that. You had to raise it to the point where they at least care to get their money back. Uh, 1500 bucks, I think half the time they bother to apply to get it back. That's refundable. So I would suggest more if we have the option, because uh, is there a fee, is there a cost for the permit? Well, I think that it's really, um, there is no application fee. No application. Um, so they can be Some communities from. have a, a substantial application fee that discourage it, but we're not proposing that. Yeah, I would just, I'd like to see it put in a permit at least. Uh, if there's no fee, I have no problem with that. It's just, I hate to see people just say, I'm going to do it, heck with it. And I'd like to at least have the penalty a little more significant if we leave, if we have the option of doing it. We that. can look at that. We can look at that, not what's the appropriate number to strongly discourage you from breaking yeah, any ordinance. Go through the process. Right. Work with us type thing is all I'm trying right. to say. So. No, it's all right. It was, sorry, it was, no, no, it was answered. It's, it's a good right. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, Mr. Garrigan, you have direction? Yes, I will bring this back. Um, we'll have to publish it. We'll bring this back as a formal tax amendment. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for your time okay. tonight. Reminders. Our next village board meeting is October the 6th. October the 7th is planning commission. Coffee with the mayor on the 8th. And October 13th is our next committee call. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. That motion carries.